The first topic that we are going to look at in paper F1 is recruitment and selection. So, we need to be aware of why it makes any difference who we recruit. What difference does it make to the organisation? So, first thing we're going to talk about then is why do we need to worry about it? And then we're going to talk about what the difference between these two different topics actually is. So, first of all, you can see the recruitment and the selection process. What happens if we don't have the correct staff? First of all, work will be of a poor quality. If we don't get the correct staff, they may not have the skills to actually do the work properly, so they may just perform it very poorly. So poor quality work. Why does that matter? Because obviously it will be more expensive if you have to keep fixing any problems or you might upset your customers and you might lose their custom in the future. So they might think the products, the services are so poor, I'm not going to come back again. So you need to make sure that you recruit the right people to prevent the chance of having poor quality work. There will also be poor morale. People who are not particularly good at their jobs often don't enjoy those jobs. We will see later on during the course that this can affect their work colleagues. Now, some of you may have been in this situation yourselves, where you are with somebody who is not particularly good. They show that everybody else perhaps is affected by that and it ends up upsetting everybody. So if we get a poor quality worker, then not only will their own work be poor, but they could also affect other people. The third one, high staff turnover. Staff turnover simply means that people leave the organisation. High staff turnover simply means that there are a lot of them that are leaving the organisation. Why does that matter? Well, obviously, if you have people who are leaving on a regular basis, you have to replace them. That will have costs. We'll talk about those later on because you need to recruit them. But also, once you've got them, you'll need to train them. So high staff turnover, if you choose the wrong people, they will realise that they're not going to be very good at the job and they will simply leave. And finally, sort of following on from that point, you will waste a lot of time, you will waste a lot of money recruiting more staff. And who is going to waste their time? This will often be senior management the people who actually make the decisions about who they're going to employ, they will be interviewing people and they'll have to waste their time because if people leave, they've got to keep replacing them. So they have to waste their own time looking and dealing at more interviews. All the time that they are spending interviewing people, they can't be doing anything else. So recruitment and selection it is very, very important that we get the right people. Because if we get the wrong people, they are going to affect an awful lot of things inside the organisation. So, where are these people going to come from? Well, we can promote from inside the organisation. We can recruit from outside the organisation. A lot of the things that we're going to talk about in this first chapter... I will refer to us recruiting people from outside the organisation. We'll talk about things like job advertisements and things like that. apply to if you're recruiting from inside the organisation as well. So just be careful of that in the exam. If you're going to recruit from inside the organisation, in other words, if you're going to try and promote somebody who already works for the organisation, a lot of the issues are exactly the same. So we've got, in this particular chapter... We're going to talk about recruitment and we're going to talk about selection. It makes sense, before we go any further, to talk about what the difference is between recruitment and selection. So, recruitment is the process of establishing that vacancies exist and communicating these vacancies to an appropriate pool of candidates. 
All that that means is we have to work out that there is a vacancy. Talk about that a little bit later. We have to work out that there is a vacancy and let people know about it. That's the recruitment process. It is not about choosing somebody. That's the next stage. That's the selection. So selection is the process of filtering candidates in order to select the individual best suited to a particular vacancy. So filtering candidates in effect means get rid of getting rid of all the ones we're not interested in until we're left with the one that we are interested in. That's the person that's going to actually get the job. So recruitment, finding out there's a vacancy, working out what that vacancy is going to be, working out what the job is going to be, letting people know about it, and then selection, choosing the right person. Now, there are various stages that we go through in this particular process. The way the examiner might ask you about this is he might, for example, mix these phrases up, mix these processes up, and ask you to put them back in the right order. So, so whenever we have a process, which means you start at one bit, you go through a number of stages and you end up at another bit, in the exam, look for the examiner simply mixing them up and saying, put them back in the right order. So you need to know what they are, you need to know what order they're going to go in. So first of all, first consideration is the type of job to be offered. If a job already exists, in other words, that somebody is already doing this job for whatever reason that they are going to be leaving. So we've got somebody who does this particular role at the moment. They are leaving because they are moving to another company. They are leaving because they are retiring. They're leaving because they're moving geographically inside the country. For whatever reason, they are leaving and we're going to simply replace them. The most important thing there will be to do what's called a job analysis. A job analysis is simply a list of what the tasks are. What does this person currently do? So that when we recruit, we know what we are looking for. We're looking for somebody who will be able to do those tasks. Second bullet point. Again, if the job requires getting something specific done, then a job analysis is the best place to start. So specific tasks, your job is to make sure that these things happen. For example, we have a project. You will be in charge of the project. You, your job will be to make sure these tasks get done so that the project gets finished on time. Again, in those kind of circumstances, a job analysis is very useful. So a job analysis that says this is what you must do when you are working. Here are the things we want you to achieve. Underneath that, if the role of the job is likely to change. Now, that's the sort of thing that you often get in a small company. In a small company, often we're not entirely sure what we will want somebody to be, do to be doing in 10, 15, 20 years if they are still working for the company. Because obviously, the role of what they are doing is going to change. Imagine that you start a company with three people. To start with, everybody probably has to do everything. Has to deal with customers, has to make sure the bills are paid. Everybody has to deal with everything. As the company grows from three people to 30, from 30 people to 300, from 300 people to 3,000, then obviously the work is also going to change. So what you may want to do is you may be more interested in getting the right kind of personality who will perhaps be able to do lots of things in the future rather than saying, this is what we want you to do today. Now, if that's the sort of thing you're going to look for, then what's better is to do what's called a person specification. So a job analysis here are the tasks we want you to do. A person specification, we will get the right personality and worry about what the tasks are later on. The tasks may even change quite a lot. So as long as we've got the right person, 
they will be able to do whatever tasks we ask them to do. So again, in the exam, the examiner might say, which of these two, person specification, job analysis, which of these two do you feel would be more appropriate in this particular case? And he'll tell you some facts about an organisation. The last couple of things we've got, if we've got a job analysis, then usually we know exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for people who've got experience who have done those tasks before. Or perhaps we are looking for people with skills who we know will be able to do those tasks. If you look in lots of organisations, particularly down at the lower end, the more junior positions, often they are based on job analysis. So if you take this job, this is what you will have to do. These are the tasks that you will have to do, which means we can recruit people who've done them before. So job analysis, you often find those down at the lower levels of the organisation. Person specification means you look for somebody with a particular personality and worry about what they're going to do later on. You often get those at higher positions inside the organisation. It's very difficult to set out all the tasks, for example, that a finance director actually has to do because some of the things they do will change. They will have to respond. They will have to think about what's happening in the outside world and respond to it. Our biggest rivals have just cut the prices of all of their products. Our biggest rivals have launched a new product which is taking away our sales. What are we going to do about it? Well, it's very difficult to do a job analysis under those circumstances because the tasks keep changing. So again, a person specification might be better. So the first thing to think about in the exam would be which of those will be more important, a job analysis or a person specification. It will obviously depend on what the situation is. Now, we are going to have lots and lots of models lots and lots of theories that we go through during the course and they are here to help us to do a bit more analysis so we have already said that there will be times when you want to recruit the correct person how can we do that what do we need to look for so rogers who is the first of the writers that we're going to talk about rogers comes up with seven different things to look for when you're looking for a personality, when you're looking for a person specification. Some of these will be more important than others depending on what the job is. So the things that Rogers comes up with, for first of all, things like the physical makeup. He's talking there about things like the person's health. Now obviously, we, whatever kind of job we've got, we want somebody who's going to be reasonably healthy. But in some jobs, it is more important than in others. For example, when you are recruiting a lecturer to do what I do, health is actually very, very important. And the reason is that because I have a timetable, which means I do not have that many spare days left over. My students have timetables without many spare days left over. So if I am ill, if I am away from work because I am sick and we need to try and reschedule a class, it's difficult to find a day that I have got free and also my students will have free. So the easiest thing to do is to actually come into class even if you're not very well. So general good health is quite important for a lecturer simply because it's very difficult to rearrange things if a lecturer is off sick. Attainments. Things like qualifications. As an electorate in accountancy, what kind of qualifications do you expect that I have got? Well, presumably, one of the key things, because I'm training you to be an accountant, would be for me to have an accountancy qualification, which I have. I am a qualified accountant. So there may well be things that you need particular qualifications that you want from a particular person. So I am a qualified accountant. I am also, interestingly enough, I'm also a qualified teacher, although I can't say that for all the lecturers here. 
but all the lecturers here are all qualified accountants. So you would expect me to be a qualified accountant because I'm trying to help you to get through your accountancy qualifications. General intelligence. Now, obviously, in this particular case, that is probably covered by the one that we've just said. So because I have passed all my accountancy exams, I think we can probably work out that I had the intelligence to do those. But in other situations, it might be that there aren't any formal qualifications that we want. It may not be appropriate, but we want someone who's got a general level of intelligence. Any particular special aptitudes. So that might be particular skills that we have got. Um, as far as being a lecturer is concerned, probably there aren't that many of them. Um, I suppose you could include things like writing the material, which is different to talking about the material. It's different to delivering a lecture. So I suppose special aptitude writing, being able to write reasonably good business English, English would probably be a reasonable aptitude that you could expect for this kind of job. Again, it would be different for other kinds of jobs. Interests. That will be things outside of work. To be honest with you, that really doesn't make an awful lot of difference as far as my job is concerned, but it may do for others. Disposition is things like your attitude. Now, one of the things that you have to think about, if you wanted to recruit somebody to be a lecturer, one of the things they have to be able to do is to stand up in front of groups of people and talk to them. Now, I have, as throughout my career as a lecturer, I've spoken to some very small groups of students. The smallest group I've ever spoken to is one. So I've had one student in the class. The biggest I've ever had is about 400. So you have to be able to stand up and talk potentially to 400 people, potentially to one person. I suppose you could argue that doing this particular kind of video, technically I'm actually talking to nobody except the camera. And I have to say, this is a slightly diff this is a slightly strange thing for me to be doing, to be giving a lecture, and there's actually nobody physically present. So the idea is, you've got to have the attitude that you are able to do that if you are going to be a lecturer. Now, there are lots of jobs, particularly things like service industries, where you are dealing with customers, where that would be a particularly important one. Are you happy at dealing with customers? Are you friendly? Are you approachable? So your disposition could be a particularly important thing. And finally there, your circumstances. That would mean things such as, do you have a family? Because that might affect your ability to work certain hours or when you would be available to come and maybe work unsociable hours. So circumstances might make a difference. Now, there are seven different things there. Rogers does not say that they are all important all of the time. What you would have to do if you were a manager is to think which of those would be the most important. So for a lecturer, probably things like the attainments, the disposition and the health, the physical makeup would probably be amongst the most important ones. For another kind of situation, something different might be important. Now, the key thing with Rogers is that we look for the right person. We look to see, has the person that we're looking at, what kind of person do we want? Are we worried about their disposition? Are we worried about their attitude? Are we worried about their qualifications? What is the most important? And then we know who to look for. So, once we have recruited the right person, then, once we've recruited and selected the right person, then we will worry later on about exactly what they are going to do. Now, why do you think a person's specification is an important thing for a lecturer? Because if you think about being a lecturer, it's very difficult to write down an exact list of all the tasks that a lecturer has to do. An awful lot of it is dealing with students and you can't tell how students are going to react to something. So it'd be very difficult to write down and say, here are all the tasks that you want a lecturer to do. So it's actually easier just to get the right kind of personality and then let them get on with the job 
and they will deal with all these tasks, let them get done however they feel is best. So a person specification is where we decide we're going to have the right person and then later on we're going to worry about what they actually do. Okay, over the page we have got the stages that we go through when we're looking at recruitment and the stages that we go through when we're looking at selection. So first of all, when we're going through recruitment, gap analysis, what we're thinking about there is we're thinking about are there any new roles to create? Do we have any gaps? So, for example, it could simply be that an organisation is getting bigger and needs more people to do something. So at the moment, we have got one person who is doing all the administration. The company is growing bigger. We now need two people to do, the re to do all this administration. So it could simply be a physical gap. We need more people. It could also be a physical gap from the point of view of perhaps we are expanding. So we have got somebody who does a particular job in the UK. We are going to open up another office in the Far East. We will need somebody to do the same work, but in a different location. So again, there would be a gap there. It might be, for example, that the organisation is expanding, perhaps by doing something new. So we have got an organisation that has always trained ACCA students, and now we decide that we're going to start training other kinds of students. Perhaps we're going to start training legal students. Well, there will be some gaps there, because obviously the people who do the training for accountants will not necessarily be the same people that you'd want training legal um, students. So the idea is that we might identify a gap because we're branching out into something new. So for whatever reason, there will be some kind of gap. So we have to identify what that gap is. Once we know that there's a gap there, we then have to think, can that gap be filled with somebody that we already have on the staff? So maybe if there is extra administration, we might be able to get somebody who already works here to do part of that work. So maybe what we get is two or three people who've got other jobs and give them a little bit of the administration each. That way, we don't need to employ a new person. But if there is a lot of work to do, or the new job is, is in a different location, then obviously we will need to get a new person. So what we can do is we can identify some vacancies. We can make the decision that we're going to recruit people. As I say, your alternative is to share the work out amongst the staff you've already got. Once we've decided that we're going to recruit, we have some kind of job analysis or some kind of person specification. So we've already talked about person specifications. You look for the right kind of person with the right kind of skills. Job analysis we are looking for, here are the tasks that somebody is going to do. So we're going to make sure we get somebody with skills and experience. And once we've done that, we advertise. So there's quite a long and detailed process that comes out before you actually advertise anything. The second thing we do, once we've done the recruitment, is we now start doing the selection. So first of all, we review people's CVs. Now, if you haven't come across what a CV means, it's basically shorthand for what's called a curriculum vitae, which is a fancy way of saying it's a summary of what you are like. It has things like your background, the schools you went to, the qualifications you've got. It would also have details about what pre-posts you've had, what skills you have gained, what experience and knowledge you have got. We would look through those CVs. There would be some candidates who are obviously not right for the job. And we would have to contact them and say, unfortunately, we're not going to be pursuing your application any further. But there will be other people that we are interested in meeting and finding out a little bit more about. 
a little bit later on, we'll be talking about interviews and we'll be talking about what are called assessment centres. Both of those are used to try and find the correct candidate. So we might have six or seven people that we interview for a particular job. We then have to select the one that we are particularly interested in. And we have to let them know. Now that we've looked at the various stages that you go through when you're doing recruitment or when you're doing selection, we're going to look at how you're going to let people know about these jobs in a bit more detail. So the first thing that we've got, two main methods of recruitment. Either an organisation does its own recruitment, and the main way that it will do this is by placing adverts for jobs, and we'll talk about that in a minute, or alternatively, use a recruitment agent to carry out the recruitment. Now, why would you want to perhaps carry out your own recruitment? Maybe you are looking for something in particular. That might be, for example, that something is very technical. And so you, as an organisation, want to make sure you hire the right people. So you want to actually place the advert, have it exactly how you want it, perhaps do all the interviewing, you perhaps want to choose everybody. So if you want to go down this route, it's usually because there are particular skills or particular people that you want to try and recruit and you feel that your organisation would understand them better than an outside organisation like a recruitment agent. So you can do either of these two. You can, of course, if you want to, use a recruitment agent. There are lots of reasons why you might do that. We'll talk about them again a little bit later, but it might just be something as simple as your organisation's got other things to do. Let's leave the recruitment to some specialists. So in the exam, that will probably be a practical thing. Here is a small company. The Senior directors are all very, very busy. They do something very, very specialised. What's going to be the best thing for them to do? Well, they could use a recruitment agent because they're all very busy and recruiting people takes time. On the other hand, if they do it themselves, they will make sure they get the right person. So it'd be up to you to look at the facts that you are told and to give your opinion. So if we decide that we are going to do our own recruitment and we're going to place our own adverts, there are a number of things that we need to consider. First of all, where are you actually going to place your adverts? They need to be placed in an appropriate place, an appropriate way. So something that is becoming more and more common is looking at things like doing advertising for jobs on the internet. What is the advantage of that? Well, the biggest advantage is that there is a large pool of candidates. If you are advertising a job on the internet, then anybody around the world who has access to the internet could potentially apply for that job. So that would obviously open up the number of people who might be interested and the number of good quality candidates that you will get. The downside of advertising on the internet is, in a way, it's exactly the same. You might get so many candidates applying that it becomes difficult to rule out who are the ones you're interested in and who are the perhaps ones that you're not going to be as interested in. So the internet is becoming more and more common. You could advertise in specialist journals. Now, that would be something like a good example of a specialist journal is something like the ACCA student newsletter. Do you ever see jobs advertised in the ACCA newsletter? The answer is obviously yes. What kind of jobs? Will there be accountancy jobs? Why would accountants advertise in the ACCA newsletter? Because they know that that newsletter is read by lots of potential trainee accountants. So it makes sense to advertise the job somewhere where there's going to be a lot of potential candidates. So what's good 
about advertising in a specialist magazine, you are not wasting your money. Advertising in a newspaper will, an, or where an awful lot of people are not in the slightest bit interested in the job that you are advertising. So you get specialist magazines for various professions, for various jobs, so advertise in those. You often get those particular kind of adverts. They're not for junior level positions. They're not for what are called entry level positions, the first job somebody has as an accountant. They're often for something where you need two or three years experience because they're often gonna be students who have got two or three years experience they will be able to find out about those jobs and they'll apply for them. So specialist journals are a good cost-effective way of meeting on advertising your job to the kind of person that you want. They're very, very good if you've done some kind of job analysis because you can work out where people with the right experience, where people with the right skills will see your advertisement. They don't work as well for person specifications. Because if you want the right kind of person, they may not necessarily be reading that particular magazine. So they work well in certain circumstances, but not in all of them. The third option we've got is in the local press. So perhaps a newspaper that's based in a particular city, or even in a large city, perhaps a particular part of that city. Again, these are particularly good for entry level jobs. The kind of junior positions that somebody has when they first come in to a particular industry, when they have very little experience. Why is the local press good? Because you're not looking for anybody with particular skills because they won't have got those skills yet. You're probably looking for somebody relatively young and because of that, they probably won't necessarily have a lot of money so they will probably be living locally. So the idea is that you advertise to where these people are going to read about your organisation. So the local press is a good way of getting more junior level jobs. And finally, you might decide to advertise in the national press. Now, this one isn't as common. You do see it occasionally, but it's not as common because it's quite expensive. Really, the time that you'd be looking in the national press would be when you want somebody particularly senior and you're just trying to make everybody aware that this job has come up. You might only have maybe 30 or 40 people in the entire country who are even qualified to apply for this job. So the national press might be the only way of getting to them. So... All of those are good in different ways. The internet is good because it's relatively cheap and you reach a lot of people. Specialist journals are good because they're relatively cheap and they get to people with particular skills and experience. Local press is relatively cheap and it gets to people with very little experience. National press is expensive, but it may be the only way of people who you are interested in of them actually finding out about your job. So they're all good in different ways. Now, when we are going to do our advertisement, what do we need to say? Well, obviously, it depends on what the position is. If it's an entry-level position, if for something it's like a trainee accountant with no experience necessary, you probably don't need to put an awful lot in. On the other hand, if it's going to be for somebody with two or three years experience, you need to be more detailed about what the job is going to entail and what the company is going to be doing. So here are the sort of things that you may include. Some kind of job description. Again, for an entry-level position, you probably don't need that, but a more senior one, you do. What is the job going to be? Is it perhaps being in charge of a team of people? Is it perhaps doing something that's very technical? So what's the job going to be? Maybe a little bit on what the organisation actually does. If you want to get good candidates to apply to your organisation, you'll need to give them some clues as to why they should do. What's good about your particular organisation? There will be many people who've never heard of your company. So give them an overview of what the organisation is like and why it would be a good organisation to come and work for. Obviously, 
the salary is going to be important. For some people, that will be perhaps the main reason why they'll even consider a job. But even if salary is not that important to a person, you still need to give them a vague idea of what it's going to be. Person specification. Although we are probably looking, because we've got a job description, we are probably looking at somebody with skills and, exper and experience, there may also be some kind of person specification in there, particularly for some kind of senior job, or perhaps where it's not going to be overly clear what the job will entail. Somebody, for example, who is going to be dealing with heads of other departments, good communication skills would be important, regardless of what the jobs actually are. So, again, in more senior roles, that one is often quite important. And finally, something that's very, very rare that people actually forget about a lot. If you are interested in the job, how are you going to find out more about it? Who are you going to send your details to? Some kind of contact information. Finally, in this little section, it says a variation on this is where we have something like a recruitment fair. And a recruitment fair is where you get a large number of organisations who all go to one particular location. And then graduates, there are often graduate recruitment fairs, but people who are interested in the jobs will come along to the particular location and they can go and find out about lots of companies in one go. Now, the reason I've put it with advertisements is because people will pick up information about the organisation. In effect, you are still advertising why they should come to you. Why should they come to this store rather than the other 49 companies who are all advertising in the same place? So you need to still advertise to recruit them. So job advertisements. As we said a little bit earlier, an alternative is to simply use a recruitment agent to get somebody else to do all of this for you. Now, there are various reasons why you might decide that this is what you want to do. So we can see, we can see here that there are various reasons why we might decide to use recruitment agencies rather than others. We've got a list of them. Before we start looking at that, just be careful because there are two different ways that recruitment agents work. Most of you, most of you will have come across a recruitment agent. And what happens with a recruitment agent is you go to the recruitment agent with your CV, you have an interview with the recruitment agent, and they will then get jobs given to them by various companies, and they will recommend you for certain of those jobs. So you go along, you have an interview with the recruitment agent, they find out what you're interested in, they find out what your experience is, and a job comes in that they think you'd be suitable for. They then send your CV off to the company, and usually the company will then want to interview you. But that's not the only way it can operate. The alternative way things can operate is the complete reverse of that. It's what you sometimes call as headhunting. And the idea behind headhunting is what happens initially is the company goes to the recruitment agents and says, we have got a job, please find somebody to fill it. So the normal way that happens is you have already gone along. You are already registered with the recruitment agent. A job comes in and they say, ah, oh, here is somebody who is on our books. They would be suitable. Headhunting, the opposite works. Here is a job. Go out and find somebody that you've had no contact with so far and see if they would be interested in this job. Headhunting tends to be used a lot more for senior positions than it is for junior positions. Now, there are some advantages of doing using a recruitment agency. First of all, as we've already said, less distracting for managers. If I am a manager in a small company, I have got other things to get on and do, I haven't got time to worry about recruitment as well. I know it's important, but I just don't have time to worry about it. So I will simply pay a recruitment agent and let them worry about it. 
That way I can get on with what I am good at. It may be faster. The ideal candidate might have already gone to the recruitment agent. The recruitment agent might already have this person's details. So rather than having to go and advertise and get a CV and all these kind of things, it can be a lot faster because the recruitment agent has already done quite a lot of this. I can gain access to all the people on the recruitment agent's books wherever they live, whatever magazines that they read. Potentially, if the right candidate is there, I can find them quickly and easily. The agency has knowledge of how to recruit staff. This is something we will see again later on during the course. I am perhaps the chief accountant in an organisation and I want to recruit some more accountants. Now, I'm an accountant. That's what my skill is in. That's what my experience is in. That is what my knowledge is in. Recruiting people, I may not have the skills to do it. So just simply pay somebody else to do it on your behalf. Get a recruitment agent to do it. And finally in that bit, salaries. If I have got to recruit someone, I would have no idea what kind of salary they would expect. So a recruitment agent will be able to do that for you and say, for this kind of job, in this kind of location, for this kind of company, you should be offering this sort of amount of money. So there are lots of advantages to using recruitment agents. Unfortunately, there are lots of disadvantages as well. So the main one is the agency doesn't really know what the organisation is like. The recruitment agent has not worked in this particular company. So they don't know what it's like. So they don't necessarily know exactly what kind of person the company wants to recruit. So sometimes they'll choose the wrong person. You might have, you might have a, a recruitment agent that perhaps has a target. We have got to get 100 people into employment by the end of the month. And if we do that, we get a bonus. Well, maybe they will just send you somebody just to meet that recruitment target, even if they're not particularly suitable. Hopefully that one doesn't happen very often in real life, but it's a possibility. And thirdly, and thirdly, it can be expensive. You will have to pay a fee to the recruitment agent, and it's often quite a substantial fee. So that's money that you could have used to do this yourself. So you have to decide whether it is worth it for the extra skills that they bring, for the extra time that they save. Now, recruitment then, we've already talked about, is the idea that you decide, are there any vacancies, and you let people know about them. But once you have done the recruitment, you then have to select the right person. And so the final couple of bits and pieces we're going to look at in this section are all to do with selection. How do you choose the right person? So we've already mentioned that usually you start out with some kind of CV, some kind of application form. So you've advertised the job, you get lots of candidates who contact you saying, I am interested, here are my details. Some of those candidates, you will realise, don't have the right skills, don't have the right qualifications, don't have the right level of experience. So unfortunately, you simply write back to them and say, I'm sorry, but we're not interested. But there will be some, however, that you are still interested in. So you need to select the right one. There are various different ways that you can do this. You could, for example, talk about using interviews. And we'll talk about interviews in a minute. You could, for example, use what are called aptitude tests. An aptitude test is seeing, are you going to be any good at this particular role? It's often a very practical one. And finally, an assessment centre, which tends to be a mixture of various other ways of doing things. Which of these methods of selection is the best? Well, the short answer is that there isn't one single best way. So in the exam, you may be asked 
to think about what are the advantages of each of these methods, or you might be given a little story about a company and asked for them, for this particular organisation, what would be the best thing for them to do. So we're going to look in a bit more detail at interviews, first of all. So I would guess that most of you, at some point in your life, have had an interview for something. You will sit down with usually one interviewer, but there are variations on this. You might have a team of interviewers. I have been interviewed by three people at the same time, and they can take it in turns to ask questions. Some of you might have been in the position where there are two or three of you actually being interviewed. Now, I've never actually been in that situation, but I have got colleagues who have told me of situations where there are three or four interviewers and there are three or four people who are in being interviewed all at the same time. There's made potentially eight people in the room asking different questions to different people. So interviews are still fairly common. They are still really the most common way that people are selected to actually get a job. Why are they so common? First of all, they are flexible. So it means that different interviewers can conduct their interviews in different ways. So in one interview, they might be particularly interested in the skills somebody has got. In another one, they might be much more interested in the personality of the candidate. So it depends on the circumstances. In the interview, you can do just about anything. They allow the interviewer to ask questions. In other words, they ask the interview, they allow rather the interviewer to find out more information that perhaps wasn't on the CV. So, you mentioned this in your application, tell me some more about it. You mentioned this bit in your application, give me some more details of what you actually did. Now that's good for a number of reasons. One reason is it allows the interviewer to check facts particularly if we are looking for somebody with a particular set of skills or a particular set of experience, we can check that they actually have got that experience. So I am looking for somebody who's got two years' worth of experience, perhaps being in charge of a group of three people in the finance department. You, in your application form, you said that in your last finance department you were, you were responsible for two people Tell me what kind of things you had to do. What was your little section doing? And how did you have to manage your staff? So it gives them a chance to check that the person, the candidate, actually did these things. It also allows them to assess what are called their interpersonal skills. One of the things that even as an accountant you will have to do is to deal with other people. In an interview, the interviewer can test and check what your interpersonal skills are like. Do you look them in the eye when you answer a question? Or do you look down? Do you talk in a strong, clear voice? Or do you mumble and talk very quietly? So they can actually ask things and find out what you are going to be like as a person. So there are lots of reasons why interviews are still very, very popular. There are, however, some difficulties with doing interviews. By their very nature, they are artificial. It is very rare in your working life that you are ever sitting down and having a one-to-one -one talk with your boss. It doesn't actually happen that often. It also is not necessarily particularly useful in certain circumstances. So again, imagine that you were running a college and you were going to recruit some new lecturers. Well, you could sit down with a lecturer in, uh, in an office and chat to them for an hour. At the end of it, would you know if they're a good lecturer or not? Well, the short answer is probably no. What would be a better way of finding out if a candidate would potentially be a good lecturer? Get them to do a practice lecture. Get them to do a presentation like this one. So, interviews sometimes don't really work. They're certainly not particularly good if you've got a practical kind of job. They require the interviewer to be skilled. 
So that's one of the reasons we saw earlier why you might get a recruitment agent to do this, because interviewing people is a skill, and lots of managers don't actually have that skill. They've never been trained in it. And the manager has to be well prepared. So they have to have found out more about the candidate. Some managers don't have time and they go into an interview and they don't really know what the person is about. They don't really know what the person has done in the past. So they don't get the most out of that interview. They can lead to what's called the halo effect. The halo effect is where there is one particularly good thing on an application form or there is one particular thing that the candidate says that the interviewer really likes. And because of that, the interviewer will think that everything else is good about the candidate. So let's say, for example, that you have got somebody who goes along to an interview and they have won a prize for ACCA. Perhaps they've got the highest mark in the world in a particular ACCA exam. The interviewer may well think that there's lots of other things that are good about them as well. So they may think they've got very good interpersonal skills, when in fact they haven't, but they just happen to have passed an exam. So the halo effect is where you see one thing is very good and you then think that everything is going to be good. Cloning is something that, again, human beings are very, very prone to. Cloning simply means... When I am interviewing you for a job, I will be very conscious of the most recent person who had that job. And if you are like that person, then I will probably give you the job. So cloning means that you tend to choose the same kind of person. We had somebody who did the job well, so the next person who is the same, we will offer them the job, assuming that they will do well as well. So cloning is where we tend to get the same kind of workers over and over and over again. Well, sometimes that's good, but often it isn't. Final bit we've got there, they are time consuming. They will take up a large amount of your time. And remember, if you're a manager, you may not have an awful lot of time that's spare. So some managers will actually resent this amount of time that they have to spend. Remember, to a certain extent, it's easier to spend a lot of time recruiting people, to spend a lot of time selecting them, to get the right person. It might be quicker than recruiting the wrong person and then having to try and get rid of them. So they are time consuming. So interviews are a very formal, slightly awkward way of choosing people, selecting people. Something that's becoming increasingly common are what are called assessment centres. An assessment centre simply means that we have a variety of selection methods. Yes, we interview people, but we will also do things like practical tests. Why would you want to do all these different things? Because, first of all, how do candidates deal with others? Often you will get people to take part in some kind of group exercise so everybody gets together and tries to do this or tries to achieve that. Now, if that's the kind of exercise you've set, you're actually not that bothered about whether the group succeeds or not. That's not the point of the exercise. The point of the exercise is to see who takes charge, who organises everybody else, who listens to other people's ideas, who comes up with ideas in the first place, who is supportive. Looking at interpersonal skills that will become important when you're working as part of an organisation. Now, you can't really do any of those as part of just an interview. Candidates can be observed over a longer period of time. Most interviews last for about 30 minutes, and after that, that's done. 30 minutes to try and decide whether somebody should join your organisation or not. Whereas an assessment centre can often last over a number of days, three or four days, doing a different thing each day. It's good because it, you probably get a better view of whether these people are good or not, rather than half an hour, which is artificial. The other thing is that they may well get tired, and you can see how they react when they are tired, and that might be a very telling thing that you are interested in. Um, the candidates can be given practical tests 
that reflect the job. In other words, if I am going to get you to do something practical, I can give that to you as part of your assessment centre and I can see how you're going to get on. So this is going to replicate what you have to do at work. Let's see how good you are. There are, of course, problems with using assessment centres exactly the same as there are problems with any way of selecting people. Candidates will do well in some areas and not in others. That is one of the big dangers that as you start doing more and more and more different tests, you will find some people are good at one test and they're not as good at another test. So you'll get conflicting results and you'll end up with a lot of people in the middle who've been good at something and bad at something else. And you've now got to try and decide who is actually the best of them. It's possible to coach candidates. If I know that I'm going to be given a practical test, it shouldn't be that difficult to work out what that practical test is and then I can simply practice for it. And finally, they may be expensive for the simple reason that they obviously take a lot of organising. They may well involve hiring places to stay, maybe books, booking on courses to do things. So they can end up being very expensive. If you get the right person, however, it's probably worth spending the money. Now, one of the final stages of our recruitment and selection process, we have done our recruitment, we've decided who we want to employ, what are we looking for, skills or personality. We've advertised in the paper or we've, we've used a recruitment agent, we've done our selection using our interviews, using our assessment centre, and finally, we need to take up some references. So references basically telling you what this candidate has done before. Problems that we have, they may not be suitable. So for example, if you've got somebody who's applying to a job from abroad, they may obviously be written in a foreign language. It may be difficult to track down somebody's previous employer if they have come from abroad. There may not even be a previous employer. If you're a student and you're about to take up your first full-time paid job, you might not actually have any references. Second, they may be biased. They are usually written by somebody who worked with this candidate at their previous employment. Well, why did they leave? Did they leave on bad terms? In other words, did they have a row? Did they have an argument? And that's why the candidate has left. In which case, you're not going to get a very fair reference. Yet it will probably be too biased to say that the person isn't very good. On the other hand, you might have got a very good worker. And perhaps the company don't want to let the worker leave because they're so good. They don't want them to go. In which case, you will also get a bad reference. You'll get a bad reference the second time because people want you to think that's a bad candidate. We won't employ them because that way they can stay where they are. And finally, they may be too brief. It would be very difficult to write about you, all the things you're good at, all the things that you're not so good at, all the times when you've done good work, all your qualifications. It'd be very difficult to do that in a short two or three page document. So although references are still used by most companies, they're not quite as useful as they used to be. So the idea behind chapter one is simply that we need to recruit the right people. So we need to find out that there are some jobs. We need to look for the right kind of person, whether it's a person specification or whether it's a job description. We then need to let the people know. We need to induct the people who arrive. And we finally need to make sure that we choose them, we select them in the right kind of way.